Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here this evening uh, to this Friends of Imperial College event. Uh, it's been organized in association with our hosts uh, this evening, uh, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, uh, also the Imperial College Business School, and ECOSIT. Uh, ECOSIT is a global network of academic, industry, and public sector partners engaged in research with the uh, goal of not only making uh, cities sustainable ecologically, uh, but also thriving economically. They're financing the making of a film this evening, which we hope won't get in the way of the action, uh, or will film the action when it comes. Uh, this will be available for download on the Friends site and on the EchoSit site, and probably somewhere on the Imperial College website as well. Uh, the work at college, uh, the research work that goes on that uh, uh, backs up the, uh, the work that uh, Peter Head of, of Arabs is doing, is financed or funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. I'm really delighted to see so many people coming here this evening. Uh, welcome. My name is uh, Roderick Brees Jones, and I'm chairman of the Friends of Imperial College. Friends uh, offer those interested in science, medicine, technology, the opportunity to learn from scientists, engineers, and thinkers who are connected to the college in some way. In this way, we promote the public understanding of science, and we support the college. Any surplus we make from our events uh, is donated to the college uh, for their students' opportunities fund to help needy students. I'd like to flag up our next event. Um, whether I can do that with this thing or not, I don't know. But, uh, no. Anyway, our next event is on the 14th of January uh, next year, uh, when Professor Michael Duff, who is, in, who is the Abdus Salam Chair of Theoretical Physics at Imperial College, will be talking about one of the deepest mysteries of the universe, the unified theory, which brings together the fundamental forces of the universe in one single theory. In his talk entitled The Eleven Dimensions of the Unifying Theory, um, I've heard Professor Duff talk, and he has the extraordinary ability to make these complex things, well, simple. Believe me, come along and hear him. I'd like to introduce our main speaker, uh, Peter Head, this evening. Uh, He's a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and he's appointed uh, Order of the British Empire. He's a director of Arabs, and uh, he's heading up the newly integrated business of planning and integrated urbanism. An imperial alumnus from this department, civils, same as me. His latest claim to fame is that he featured on the cover of Time magazine in the beginning of October as one of the heroes of the environment. There are quite a lot of heroes on the front, and his dot was up to the, uh, slightly to the right, up and to the top. Uh, nevertheless, there was a, a, a good piece about him in the magazine, and that you can reach through our website. Um, after leaving college, he uh, spent some time his, in his career in building steel bridges and buildings. Uh, he became the chairman of the Steel Construction Institute. He then led the development of advanced composite materials in bridges and received a number of awards, including the Royal Academy of Engineering Silver Medal for an outstanding contribution to British industry. He became project director for a major crossing, uh, crossings, including the second Severn Crossing, and uh, received his OBE for what I think is very interesting, delivering projects. I mean, that sounds about as hard as it comes. It was on this project that his interest in sustainable development grew, and he took the f uh, role as the first chairman of the London First Sustainability Unit, and then was asked by the Mayor of London to become a commissioner on the newly formed London Sustainable Development Commission in 2002, and he's recently been reappointed. He also chairs the Commission's subgroups on transport and sustainable construction. I think uh, he uh, has just been giving a series of lectures called the Brunel International Series, which is financed by the Institution of Civil Engineers. He entitled it uh, Entering the Ecological Age, the Engineer's Role. 
It provides very useful reading. Uh, you can link, uh, you can download it from our site, uh, from our site, and from the Institution of Civil Engineers site. And well worth, uh, for those that you are interested and want to find out more about the, the background to uh, what Peter will t talk about this evening, it would be a very good thing to, to get hold of. After Peter has spoken, we'll be hearing from uh, Professor Neil A. Shah, who's Professor of Process Systems Engineering in the Department of Chemical Engineering. He's a co-director of the BP Urban Energy Systems Project, which is working towards reducing the energy intensity in cities. Uh, Professor Shah will be talking about the contribution of his team uh, to the Dongtang project. Uh, we also have um, Assistant Professor Lars Fredriksson from the Imperial College Business School, who is working on design-driven innovation and how we can learn from mega projects such as Dongtang. He will give his perspective on the project. Then have the opportunity to have all three of them uh, in a panel uh, for questions and, and discussion and contributions. So without more ado, and that's quite a lot of ado, uh, may I give you Peter Head? begin by saying what the structure is. I'm going to do a bit of an introduction, which is really you know, talking about some fundamental facts about where we are in relation to our journey of living on this planet. I'm then going to talk about the, this emerging vision of an ecological age, which actually was invented and developed in China. Uh, I'm then going to talk about guidelines and frameworks and objectives uh, after I presented the Dongtang project as a demonstrator in China. And then I'm going to talk about how we can retrofit our way to this same paradigm shift in developed countries like ours. And I'm going to, going to finish with two videos, one showing a, a British city being retrofitted and the second one showing an American suburb being retrofitted. So I'm not afraid to talk about some of the most challenging um, problems that we're facing. So you're going to see China and, uh, and the West in how we get to where we want to go. But basically what I'd like to do now is to share with you where we're at. The facts of the matter are that the IPCC now reckon with the rate of warming and measured by the rate of melting of ice that there's now a 50% probability of a 5 degree rise in Earth temperature by the end of this century. And that is really a 50% probability of the end of civilization by the end of this century because 5 degrees is, is going to cause massive disruption. So this is not a, an idle moment in human history. This is a very, very serious moment. And the only thing we know how to do is to change the way we live to try and solve the problem and actually head off that level of increase. Whether you believe this is the, is the way to do it doesn't really matter. We believe in scientific, um, the precautionary principle of using scientific evidence to, to do the best that we can at the moment knowing what we know. And that's really what this is about. In the Brunel lecture, which you can not only download the paper, you can download me giving it if you want, if you're, if you're not bored with my presentation tonight. What it aims to do is to answer these relatively simple questions. Can we move towards a sustainable way of living by 2050? What policies and investments do we need to start making uh, both in developing countries and in our developed world, and, and what is the role of science and technology in, in leading the transition. So I'm going to try and sort of lead you through those answers because they're clearly relevant to this institution and our lives if you're people who live in London. The first of the, well, the second of the important facts after the global warming issue, and this is really the fundamental issue, with 9 billion people living on the planet by 2050, will have gone from a situation 100 years ago where we had eight hectares of productive land to support everyone's life on the planet to a situation where we're only going to have one and a half hectares of land to support everyone's life on the planet. That is an incon incontroversible fact. That is actually what is going to happen. And the problem is that the way we're living on the planet is, first of all, we're living in extreme uh, situation of wasting raw materials, of wasting things, but we're living in an open resource regime where we take non-renewable resources, we process them through our products and cities and infrastructure, and then we pollute the air, the water, and the soil uh, at the back end of that process. 
And what that is doing is basically destroying the fragile ecosystem that supports our life on the planet. And the rate of destruction has accelerated really significantly in the last 10 years with the growth of resource consumption in China and, to some extent, India. One way of measuring this is by ecological footprint, and this is the ecological footprint of cities around the world. And at the moment, our economic policy, I'm going to come to economics any moment, our current economic policy, wouldn't it be great if the US started its, its consumption again? Well, the US consumption consists of living on about five planets worth of resources using non-renewables. So if indeed we manage to get to a situation in this recession where, where the US comes out of it and starts that same process of using non-renewables and polluting the planet, it basically is going to accelerate us over the cliff. It is, actually isn't a solution anymore. So we are at a point in human history where the neoclassical economics model, we now know it doesn't work, and, and I, I could talk later if you question me on it, about why this recession is happening and how it is connected to this very same issue. But the one thing I, you, you will understand very clearly is that the, the, the wild oscillation in prices of food and oil and resources going up and down very rapidly is a sure sign we're reaching this point of instability where we've got to change. So essentially what's happening is that, and this is why it's difficult to see, um, what's happening is our economy is growing so quickly and so large, it's destroying the ecosystem that supports our lives. And all of our policies around the world are based on GD, growing GDP. And growing GDP is, is measured by measuring the amount of non-renewable resources we use. That's how it's worked out. So not surprisingly, we're driving ourselves essentially in, in absolutely the wrong direction. So the only way forward is a transition from using non-renewable resources inefficiently to using renewable resources very efficiently. And those countries and cities and regions that make that transition first will be the places that have vibrant economies in the future. And so it is actually quite clear and very stark. And China is the first country to have realized that this is actually what's got to happen. And one of the reasons for that is that China's ecological footprint, because of its urbanization, is growing at 3% a year. 3% means that China has to find 93 million hectares of new land every year to support the resource consumption growth as their economy is growing. It can't find 93 million hectares of land. It doesn't have it in China. It's having to go to Africa, to South America, to Australia to actually find the resources and land, and it knows it can't continue to do that for another 10 or 15 years. It is completely unsustainable, and therefore China has realized this, this doesn't work. You will also know that we have reached this amazing point in human history where for the first time we're passing the point of the peak of oil reserves. This peak has always been ahead of us in, in the past. We've always managed to keep the peak ahead we're now actually passing it, and there's absolutely no chance that we're going to find enough oil to stop the situation arising where the demand for oil every year exceeds the, the fines that we're making. And therefore, this is why oil prices become totally unstable. But the trend is that oil price will increase dramatically uh, in the future. There is absolutely no possibility of it not doing that unless oil um, consumption drops as we shift to, to other sources of, of energy. Just to make you hopefully very clear about the linkage between GDP and resource consumption, here's a graph of growing economies around the world showing energy consumption per person against GDP growth, and it's a linear relationship. It's absolutely clear. And what has then happened is that Europe and uh, Japan, uh, Europe is the, is the um, yellow uh, color there, Europe and Japan have ended up plateauing at a level of about half the level of Australia and the US because the US and Australia have mastered the art of maximizing energy consumption, mainly through the density of their cities. The difference is almost entirely due to using cars in low-density cities, which is where I'm going to finish up the presentation. So essentially, land use planning and city density is really fundamental. China is coming up the little blue line at the bottom. It's still a relatively poor country and has made a, a clear pledge now to, instead of going up this, this line up here, 
China is now aiming to head over here so that actually it flattens that demand line by at least 20%. Current policies do that. And the only way China can do that with its urbanization is to find a new model of urbanization of cities. There's no other way you can do it unless you break the industrial paradigm link between um, GDP growth and resource consumption, and particularly fossil f fuel energy. So that is essentially what the eco cities in China are all about. And just to make the point, this is a rather techie graph, but it, but it shows the amount of um, energy use per capita uh, against urban density. And it just makes the point that US cities up here use infinitely more energy p per person than this sort of sweet spot of density around 50 to 100 people a hectare. Typical cities like London, typical cities like European cities and Singapore and other cities in, in, in Asia. And the reason for that is that public transport is viable with those sorts of densities and therefore people will choose to travel by public transport <laughs> as long as it's made available at the right price. So urban planning and uh, land use uh, planning is fundamental to the whole issue of planning eco-cities and retrofitting our existing cities. And that's why this civil engineer is now in planning, because it is the only place where you can make these changes happen. <laughs> civil engineers will help deliver them, but planners have to actually make the difference, and, and that's why I'm where I am. The final point, which is the, probably the scariest point of all, is we've now reached another tipping point, which is the first time in human history, going from Thomas Malthus who said we'll never be able to feed the world. We've got, now got seven times more people. We, are, we have been able to feed the world by using fossil fuel fertilizers <laughs> to actually grow more and more food on the land, even though we're stripping minerals out. We've now reached the point where we now can't produce enough, la uh, enough food for people. So the food production per capita is now dropping quite rapidly as population grows. So again, we've got a tipping point where the poorest people in the world are now suffering this problem, which is essentially rapidly rising food prices. This is, these are the rises in price in the last year. And this, of course, has been caused by this problem of not producing enough food. And then, of course, what happens is you then get these inflationary pressures feeding through to our own industrial economic model of GDP, and all of our usual levers of interest rates now no longer apply because we've got inflation of food. So essentially, we've got into a recession now because of that inability to actually use interest rates to control this. So basically, industrial economic model is falling over. That, that's essentially the reality of where we've got to. So the only way forward is to plot our way to this ecological age. And we are very clear in Arab that there are three components to this. One is dramatic reduction in carbon emissions. And the G8 ministers, when they met in Japan uh, earlier this year, were told what I've told you. And they agreed immediately that an average 50% reduction in emissions across the world would be what would be agreed at Copenhagen next year. But what that implies is that in developing countries, we have to make an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050 from 1990 levels in order to get this heading off of the, of the uh, warming of the planet. At the same time, we have to make this step to dramatically reduce carbon foot, uh, ecological footprint, because if we don't, all of these other problems will still exist. We won't have enough food and all, and all the rest of it. And if we stop using um, fossil fuel-based fertilizers, clearly we've got to have alternative ways of growing food. So, so that's got to be dealt with as well. And then the Human Development Index has obviously got to keep going up in line with the Millennium Development Goals, because obviously there are, there are all the social uh, issues as well. So those are the three challenges. And what I'm going to do now is to show you how, in, in China and in our own society, that could conceivably actually be achieved. This is the quote from the speech that Hugh Jintao gave at the 17th Party Congress in October 2007. And essentially, he was the first leader in the world to talk about a transition to the ecological civilization, uh, developing a new fo focus on the service industry, research, design, de creating a resource-efficient society, developing a circular economy in which materials are recycled through products instead of this open-ended non-renewable resource consumption, controlling emissions effectively, and making the society ecologically aware. And one of the things underpinning what I'm talking about tonight is a massive cultural shift 
in terms of the way we all live on the planet. And this is probably the greatest challenge. And there isn't time to go into that now, but I'm very happy to talk about it because I've got lots of ideas about how we make that. But the cultural shift cannot be underestimated. So basically, in China, which is a low to middle income country, we're talking about a transition directly from the agricultural age that most of China is still in, not what you see in Shanghai and Beijing, but certainly what you see in the rest of the country, a transition directly from the agricultural to the ecological age. So it's reinventing urbanization around that, those objectives. And in order to inform this, we've now got these models. We've got the Dongtang Eco City Plan, which <coughs> I'm going to tell you about. We've also got evidence from Curitiba in Brazil and other cities. And essentially, the Dongtang work drew on evidence base from all over the world uh, in order to inform the, uh, the, the answer. So essentially, now we have that model. And that's the importance of Dongtang. It isn't a single project. It's a model for understanding how we make that transition. Dongtang was a project that we started working on in about 2005. And uh, before we got involved, the Chinese government, both in Beijing and Shanghai, decided that they wanted to build an eco-demonstrator city on the end of Chongming Island, which is just in the Yangtze River, just north of, of, of Shanghai. Uh, it's a very large site of about 84 square kilometers. And uh, they were then planning to actually plan and deliver the first phase, not a very large first phase, but a first phase by 2010. And basically, we were commissioned to do the master planning of this project on a site uh, at the southern end of the whole site area, on an area which is agricultural land, not prime agricultural land, but agricultural land. Basically, the objectives for planning the city were set out in a sustainable development framework at the very beginning of the project. And the key elements of that were environmental protection of the very sensitive wetland at the end of the island, getting the right development density, uh, the mix of uses, and socioeconomic picture that would inform the, the commercial delivery of the project, uh, particular issues about energy and emissions. And here, the client wanted all of the energy to come from renewables, absolutely nothing from fossil fuels at all. That was our starting brief. Recycling water, uh, sustainable transport, growing food, as much food as possible within the city to offset the loss of food production on the land. And finally, designing a city where people could live an ecological footprint close to the global Earthshare. So that was our starting point. In terms of protecting the wetland, uh, which is off to the right-hand side here, what we agreed was that the first thing that would happen here is we'd, we'd build into the city the, the green spaces and the green roofs and planting that would increase the biodiversity in the area compared with existing farmland. So we'd raise the biodiversity compared with the farmland, which actually doesn't have very good biodiversity. The second thing is we capture and recycle water, which wasn't happening at the moment. And therefore, the nitrate runoff from fertilizers on the land would be arrested by recycling the water. <coughs> Thirdly, and really innovatively, we would actually say all of the traffic in the city would be low emissions transport, electric, or, uh, or hydrogen fuel cells. So there would be no emissions to the air in the city. So air quality would not be damaged by, by traffic, which meant the vehicles would be quiet. Um, and finally, um, there would be no landfilling on the site, so materials would be used and not landfilled to pollute the, the earth. So those were the principles which we then developed into a control plan. And the, the little film you're now going to see covers this startup area of 630 hectares in which about uh, the plan is that about 80,000 people would live. So essentially, this was uh, a sustainable development project looking at environmental, social, and economic outcomes. And this is a, an aerial view of the master plan of that first phase development. Essentially, it's three villages of about 20 to 25,000 people each. Each village has its own uh, amenities at the center and has this uh, biodiversity reflecting the local landscape. It has culture reflected in the Chinese landscape of the open areas. It has water collection and recycling and flood protection against sea level rise. It then has accessibility, so the plan for the city uh, actually puts the social services, schools, and hospitals within walking and cycling distance of all the 
uh, facilities. Uh, there is public transport available to people within walking and cycling distance of where they live and work. And these places will be quiet because there will be very little traffic noise. There will then be social infrastructure, as I said, at the heart of each village. And then the, the, the urban infrastructure for energy production. Most of the renewable energy comes from combined heat and power plants running on waste rice husks, which lowers the footprint. Uh, there are large-scale wind. Uh, there is energy from waste. There are photovoltaics on the buildings, which doesn't provide a great deal of energy. And, uh, and, and all of that is integrated into a system. And finally, the buildings are designed to use about 70% less energy than buildings currently designed in Shanghai. So just putting some metrics around those things, we're talking about a, a development that's got about 54% residential and 46% commercial and, <laughs> uh, and other business uses and, and schools and shops. A green city, as I've described, particularly with green roofs and green areas, which reduces the heat island effect, which is the warming you get in cities in the summer that makes you use more air conditioning at night. Uh, and you can reduce that by the greening of the city. Uh, it has the right balance between attracting visitors, providing local jobs, so it's a place where people can live and work. And commercially, the opportunity for our client was, compared with a single-use development housing estate, our developer was able to get twice as much development area on the site than he thought he was going to get with a single-use development. So for him, it provided a real commercial opportunity. In terms of carbon emissions reduction, there are two components. One is the transport reduction and the other is the energy from buildings. Because all of the energy comes from renewables and we've re dramatically reduced the demand, uh, there's a reduction for 80,000 people of 350,000 tonnes a year of carbon emissions in the buildings. As I said, that comes from uh, all of these different renewable energy systems. And all of those are, exist in the world. None of what's being proposed in Dongtang is anything that doesn't exist at that scale somewhere in the world already. So it's not really new technology. It's just bringing the best from all over the world to make it happen. You can walk and cycle through the city alongside canals and waterways, which are part of the water management system. Water consumption has gone down 43% compared with business as usual. And this discharge into the estuary from the farmland has gone down by 90% by capturing and recycling the water, which is a really big advantage from the pollution point of view. In terms of the road network, that, that's the road network. So you can see there aren't, there aren't any attractive ways of crossing the city. If you want to get in a car, you have, to, you have to make a very tortured journey. So it's a lot easier just to walk and cycle or get on public transport. And there's the walking and cycling grid, which is the main way of getting around. So all of that for transport means that with the freight delivery system and consolidation centres, we're saving about 400,000 tonnes a year of carbon emissions due to transport. So the total is 750,000 tonnes a year of carbon emissions reduction for 80,000 people, which you can work out is quite a lot of carbon per person just by providing the right infrastructure and systems. And finally, on food, we're experimenting with the idea of creating food factories in the city that use hydroponic water, that use renewable energy for, for nighttime growing, and also use nutrients from the waste stream. Uh, and therefore, we can, we can get productivity of food in cities, which you're going to see later on when we come to retrofitting here. So the, the net result of all that was that we calculated that people would be able to live in Dongtang at a footprint of around 2.6 hectares per person. It's not as low as the 2 or 1.5, but it's an awful lot better than, than we have here, which is about six, or Shanghai about six, and America at about 12. So what, how do we do this? I mean, basically, in order to fashion our way towards this, we need a framework. And we believe in Arab that the best framework in the world to use is the biomimicry framework. And if you want to read a single book to understand this subject, read Janine, Janine Benyus's book, Biomimicry, because in there she looks at research into organisms that are successful on the planet, and she comes up at the end of the research with ten principles of the way to live on the planet in the ecological age, and we don't do any one of these things. In fact, we go out of our way to do exactly the opposite of almost every one of these things. And, of course, that is why we're failing to live on the planet in harmony with the natural world. And so we've, we've purloined the idea that we've got to think about smart, responsive simplicity. Our life in, 
in cities all over the world, these now layered fixes of fossil fuel fixes, one on top of the other, noisy traffic, sealed buildings, air conditioning, <coughs> all of these things are fossil fuel fixes which are stacked one on top of the other. We've got to deconstruct that into a way of living on the planet where those go away and the stupidity and waste is actually removed. And this, this framework is a brilliant way of, way of doing it. And, and we use the framework on Dong Tang and we're using it on many other uh, projects. So I'm now going to take you through the, the, the knock-on learning from Dong Tang. And the first real learning from Dong Tang was presenting it to the Mayor of London. The Mayor of London said, this is really inspirational. And what we can do now is imagine how we could transform London. So we're going to develop a London Climate Change Action Plan using some of the ideas that you've come out with and develop that. And that was published wonderfully on my six, exactly on my 60th birthday um, um, and in, in 2007. And uh, that is now a model that the C40 cities around the world are now adopting. So in, in, in some ways, the learning from Dongtang is now spreading out into the developed world as well as the developing world. And the sort of projects that we used in Dongtang as models like Freiburg, the retrofitting there, the Malmo developments, the Stockholm developments, actually the inner city developments in Vancouver, which are a wonderful model of this. If you want to go somewhere and see it, you can go to the centre of Vancouver and it's all there for you to actually enjoy. One of the, one, the city that usually comes out as the most livable city in the world. So what this means in London to make this transition is not only do we have to have a London Climate Change Action Plan of an 80% reduction in carbon emissions, which is what it's all about, which is available on the GLA website, but we also have to take London from about 5.5 hectares per person footprint to, to around 1.5 by 2050. And one of the only ways of doing that is to get to grips with the resource management and products and systems. And the transition is a great economic opportunity for London to recreate a sense of manufacturing in Thames Gateway and other areas to actually lead Europe in actually making this transition happen. Another aspect of making this happen is what framework we use to actually do the design work and do the, do the approach. And I've just got a series of headings here to, ma to make you understand you need a multidisciplinary team that understands the relationship between cities and health, between cities and economics, between cities and energy and housing and nutrition, and connecting up our cities to the, uh, to the rural lands and the water, energy and waste connections between them, of communication systems and how they can be used to enable us to make the sort of decisions that an ant uses every day to, to make its life work, we, we decide what we're going to do every day, and we don't give a damn about how efficient it is in terms of carbon. We just get on with it. Well, n no other organisms do that, and we've got to find ways of having <laughs> communication systems that enable us to make those decisions, and, it, and it's within our grasp to do that. Mobility and access systems, education, culture, new governance structures, which I think we'll probably touch on later, water management, materials and waste management, and finally, ecological footprint. We have to steer our retrofitting. Every investment we make in every city in the world has now got to drive down ecological footprint continuously. I, w I was at the European Investment Bank on Friday talking to them, and I said, why are you investing in three-level motorway interchanges in the middle of Warsaw? Uh, because it's complete madness. It's, it's actually taking the, the Poland in the wrong direction. And, and they said, well, it's, it's a political issue. We have to follow the political direction. And I said, that's absolute nonsense. It's nothing to do with politics. It's to do with understanding that that is not the way to invest money. You should be investing it in decentralized energy, energy from waste plants, uh, mass transit systems in cities, and so on. Those are the things you should be investing in. So that's essentially what we're trying to get everyone to understand. Essentially, you can't do any of that either. You can't design these things unless you understand how cities work, how resources flow, and therefore, you have to create the sort of models that Imperial College are developing with BP to look at integrated resource management in cities, how transport energy, water, energy treatment of water, energy in buildings, for example, all connect up and how you can optimize that by changing land use planning and energy supply. Uh, we've developed these models for our, for our work in Arup, and these are really essential if one's actually going to get the, these sort of understandings of optimizing these systems. And so it's a big challenge. It's multidisciplinary, team working, uh, and very complex. 
The London Climate Change Action Plan naturally looks at where the emissions come from, about 40% from housing, 33% from commercial buildings, and about 22% from ground-based trans transport. This excludes air travel. And essentially, you look at the low-hanging fruit there and you say, right, we've got to retrofit all of that, uh, improve the performance of every one of those elements. And I thought I'd pick out one of them for you just to give an example of what we think is going to have to happen in London. All of the housing and commercial buildings, the energy supply changes are going to make about 50% of the reduction in emissions happen. And that's going to happen by having decentralized energy systems, improving the renewable energy content of the power grid. So about half of the 80% emissions are going to come from supply side. But the rest comes from improving the insulation of buildings, changing behavior in buildings, people switching off lights and, and using things better, changing the appliances in buildings. But the really important number on here for those that are in structural engineering is a new build only makes 5% of the difference. This is all about retrofitting. It isn't about new build. So the government's focus on zero energy housing is actually not really that important. That, I mean, it is important, but it's only 5% of the problem. What we've got to do is, is think about retrofitting uh, our cities. That has, the only way you can do that is to look at infrastructure changes uh, and so on. I'll just quickly run through them before I finish. First of all, high-speed rail connections are really fundamental. We now know in Europe that actually up to 600 kilometers, people will now choose to travel on high-speed rail rather than intercity uh, air, air travel. So high-speed rail has to go through international airports because unless they do, people will still take flights. So actually, as you probably know, Arup is promoting taking high-speed one to Heathrow. Absolutely fundamental if we're going to reduce carbon emissions from air travel. Zero emission mass transport in cities, electric traction running on renewables, we can do that straight away. We can connect the London Underground, all of the overground rail systems to renewable energy. The government could, do, could make that happen. They're not, because they say it's really difficult. But actually, you could, and you could drive the wind renewable provision in the UK on the back of demand from, from rail. You know, you could literally do it there and actually close the loop in terms of commercial operation. Also putting consolidation centres for freight into cities and delivering freight using green vehicles would completely transform the congestion and inefficiency and waste of fuel in cities. And we already have a project to do this in the West End of London, uh, which is the obvious place. So high-speed rail, Mass transit in cities, this is Vancouver, which is one of the best examples of that working. Changing the vehicles that we're using in cities, electric vehicles. You may know that, uh, that uh, the U U UK government held a really high-level summit in, at 10 Downing Street a couple of weeks ago on the transition to electric vehicles in cities in the UK. And the great thing about electric vehicles is you can plug them into the grid overnight and therefore the energy demand we need from the grid doesn't go up anything like as much as the, you would think because you're smoothing out demand over the 24-hour period. So actually the amount of power we need goes down quite dramatically. It effectively increases the efficiency of the supply grid. So electric cars have some really exciting benefits. And as soon as they're available at the right price, the running costs are about a quarter of diesel and petrol cars. But we must get as many cars out of cities as possible. And the great advantage of getting people into buses and on bicycles is it frees up road space. That land can then be used for parks, for greening of cities, for uh, developing buildings, for creating money out of the land in order to finance the transition. Energy infrastructure then consists of the large-scale renewable energy systems, winds, waves, tidal stream, hydro, and so on. Angela Merkel is pushing very hard for a, for a renewable energy grid in Europe, which would run on renewables from North Africa, from concentrated solar, from using uh, uh, wind, waves, and tidal stream up the sea coast, and from using the mountainous areas of the Alps, the Pyrenees, and Scandinavia for hydro. We could run the whole of Europe on that combination right now with our energy demand. So it's actually doable, and that most of those technologies are now available at sensible prices. It's just a matter of investing in the right grid and getting rid of the politics associated with the whole problem, which is not a trivial, <laughs> not a trivial issue. Decentralized renewable energy in cities, which I've sort of talked a bit about. And finally, carbon sequestration, because clearly to get 80% carbon emissions reductions, we've got to sequester carbon. 
And in Arup, we strongly believe that the best way of doing that is to use algae bioreactors at uh, power stations where the carbon dioxide is taken through reactors where the algae grow using the nitrogen and carbon dioxide, absorb the carbon dioxide, and the algae can then be used in various uh, systems for combined heat and power plants, sorry, for, for a, uh, anaerobic digesters which produce energy and for other uh, ways of producing hydrogen and, and useful products. We believe this is probably going to be the right answer because you get something valuable out of the carbon dioxide and you can put the carbon dioxide back in the soil as a digestate from anaerobic digestion. So we're convinced this is the right answer and we're working on it uh, as we speak. And finally, waste management, the anaerobic digestion, we believe is a very, very fundamental and of course it's working in harmony with the natural world because you're working with natural organisms that have been optimized to actually digest waste. Water capture and recycling, I mean look at London, you know London is just so ridiculous that we actually treat water, we throw it in the Thames and then we're going to desalinate the water back into the water supply system. I mean what sort of nonsense is that compared with what, what is possible? Nutrient recycling into the uh, food chain in cities growing food uh, in cities, which I'm going to show you in any, any second, getting products and systems made out of reusing and remanufacturing products, the WE Directive, the End of Life Vehicles Directive, Europe's driving this in the right direction, but it isn't driving it quickly enough to affect this dramatic <laughs> reduction in, in footprint, and therefore we really need to accelerate that and, and have UT UK companies developing the technology when we're designing buildings and infrastructure, we need to be designing for the end of life, recycling, reusing, um, reconditioning of systems out of buildings and infrastructure, designing that in so we can actually use and mine the materials from our existing industrial age investments rather than having to go to new materials. And finally, communication systems, which I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to show you an example in a minute, which I think probably illustrates that best of all. So here's a video that was produced for my Brunel lecture series, and this is actually the retrofitting of Manchester using these principles. And it starts with land use planning, and basically imagining that Manchester has a high-speed rail connection, which is joined up into the city with a tram and electric traction system running on renewables. You then improve the density of mix of uses around those transport nodes to bring people, more people into the city who can walk and cycle and use public transport. Then, in putting the public transport into the streets, you green the streets, you change the way they're used, you plant them, you create walk walking and cycling routes, uh, and lower the footprint of the city. You can grow algae in, in cities by actually collecting uh, energy on the sides of buildings. You can actually put photovoltaic panels on the sides of buildings, which has been done in Manchester. You can actually grow, grow plants on the sides of buildings to actually cool the streets and create a better environment, a lower energy environment. And there's the photovoltaics on the side of the, side of the building. You can then grow food on the top of buildings. And where you see greenhouses, Arab sees nighttime cooling systems for the ventilation of the buildings uh, so they can perform both, both functions uh, and integrate it into the uh, ventilation of the buildings at night. So then you, you roll out this approach to changing the whole way that cities perform and function. And here we have the real-time communication. You're there with your PDA turning up at the bus stop just because you know that the, the bus is about to arrive, which is very safe for children and for old people. Um, and maybe the buildings in the city, maybe people are so proud of their building performance, they actually show the, the way their buildings are performing on the side as a, rather than adver advertising their products and services. So we can envisage a new way of living in, in, in developed cities, in downtown, in downtown city areas, in the way I've described. But then, of course, let's come to the suburbs, which is the ultimate challenge for uh, developing suburbs uh, in North America. So finally, as I finish, I'm going to show you a video of, of how you can achieve an ecological age transition in the suburbs of America. And the first thing is changing the streets. So you've got walking and cycling, you've got public transport, and that brings uh, more people onto the streets. It creates a better environment. The buildings can have photovoltaics of natural ventilation systems, getting rid of air conditioning, solar, uh, wind chimneys, and so on. So a dramatic reduction in energy demand, both from transport and buildings. The next thing is you can get involved in food production. There's so much land available in the suburbs. In, 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 you can actually grow loads of food. 
you can convert garages into shops, you can, you can set up um, local uh, food stalls, you can create jobs uh, within the environment, and you can use nutrient feeds from the waste stream. So there's a really improved self-sufficiency, motivation, local jobs, and so on, together with the water collection. And then there's the social aspects of, of people being able to take their houses, convert their garages into granny flats, invite your elderly parents to live with you to support grandchildren, and create a much more efficient community that actually doesn't have to travel as much, and creates much more social cohesion, which is really, really important in, in American suburbs, where none of that exists at the moment. So there's a really great opportunity to, to get social benefits uh, from this type of transition. And then moving to the streets, maybe you can get rid of these huge uh, SP, uh, SUV cars. And instead, you can put in uh, car clubs, you can put in uh, electric vehicles, which have charging points in the street opposite the public transport stops. Uh, maybe the streets can be uh, paved with materials that absorb and, and, and generate enough energy to power those vehicles. And that sort of technology is now coming along. So improved accessibility. And finally, looking at the overall streetscape, it's possible to actually put underground waste management systems in, to put in different types of paving to collect energy, to plant trees to cool the streets down, uh, to actually grow more food in the city, to increase biodiversity. And one of the most important things is obviously biodiversity, and, and that, I think, can be one of the great advantages for living in suburbs. So now coming back out to the, to the macro scale of how that looks, uh, in terms of land use planning. Essentially, we've got a suburb with, with a grid of roads and grid of transport systems. So it's possible to imagine in the ecological age model that we take a certain number of those streets, uh, put public transport on them, and at the connection points, improve the communication systems, and at those connection points, put in higher density mixed use developments, which we call smart growth, at those nodes within the suburban community, creating jobs and opportunities, linking that to the external transport with internal um, uh, transport as well, putting in green walking and cycling routes through the area, putting in food production, uh, putting in smart energy and renewable systems, and all of that is a doable commercial prospect that is already starting to happen in cities like, like Los Angeles. So to conclude, here is a list of the sorts of investments that the EIB should be making the European Union should be making, that we should now be investing. This government investment in infrastructure should be in all of these things right now, because that will lift the economy and move us to the ecological age, rather than repeating the same uh, paradigm shift, which means our economy will not be supportable in the future. So we can envisage, I think, uh, that, that we now understand that living on the planet in a sustainable way looks a lot more like the bottom than it does the top. And if there's anything that Dong Tang has done, it's, it's a planning methodology. It's a way of looking at things. It's a way of getting metrics around things, which is, is really becoming relevant all over the world. And Arif has tried very hard to put all this information in the outside world, to share it with researchers and universities all over the world, to get teaching material into universities in China particularly. And I think that, that part of the story is now happening. The next stage, of course, is to get this implementation happening, which is not so easy, but nevertheless it is beginning. And as, uh, as was said at the beginning, if you want to look at this again or go back to the detail, it is available on the Arab website. So thank you very much. So what I want to talk about is what are we doing here at Imperial College to meet exactly the kinds of challenges that Peter's told us about. So we have lots of activities in the college in practice which feed into the overall vision. So a lot of those are in individual technology. So we have a lot of work on um, silicon-based photovoltaics. We have work on organic photovoltaics. We have work on reducing the energy demand in buildings through better ventilation. We have work on uh, fuel cells, hydrogen, carbon sequestration. But what we do in our specific project, which is called Urban Energy Systems, <laughs> is to try to look at how do you bring all of those things together in what we call a system. It's a, it's a project that's been funded by BP, and we're very grateful because it was quite a visionary project for them because it, it really is starting to think about 
how would a company like BP live in a world where value comes from using fewer resources? So at the moment, you know, the more oil we use now, the more money BP makes. But they, they at least had the vision to know that that can't go on forever. So they also were interested in what would cities of the futures be like and what would those markets look like? What, what would be the implications for a company like BP? So they, they funded this project and they, and they gave us quite a generous amount of funding to think about, can we take a fresh look at cities? How can we design them uh, and organize them to be very efficient from the point of view of energy? So although there are many aspects of sustainability that you would need to think about in how you design a city, our particular focus is on energy. And you know, why cities? Well, cities are really where a lot of the future action is going to be, and it's going to be for, for a number of reasons. So first of all, it's to do with the fact that the, the world's urbanizing, as you can see here. So we've passed the point quite recently where more than half the world's population now lives in some form of city, and that, that's going to go on. And, and the, the other key thing is that, particularly in places like China, when people move to the cities, they become wealthier and they have access to different kinds of energy than they had in the rural environment. And that, if it just goes on a business as usual case, you, you just see huge increases in the amount of energy that people use as they move from the countryside to the city. So I think the third thing that's really interesting is the cities where you can make a lot of things happen because you can do things at scale. And that's a lot of what Peter said is, is underpinned by that, by having compact settlements by having high focused areas of demand, you can make technology economical. So we're interested in cities for that. What are we doing in our specific project? Our specific project is trying to look at these questions. It's trying to look at if you have a city that's organized in a particular way and the people who live in that city behave in a particular way and you make the various activities that they like to do available to them in a particular way, what does that actually mean for resource demand? So how will resource demand arise from how you organize the city and how people use the city? And then how can you perhaps influence that? How can you reduce that by organizing the city in a different way and providing the facilities that people like to use in a different way? And how can you embed technology into that? that sort of reduces resource demand, hopefully, you still have to then supply those resources. And then we look, how can we supply those resources in, in a very effective and integrated way? And the way we do it, which is, if you like, a very imperial college way to think about it, is, is an integrated mathematical modeling approach, where we look at the different subsystems that make up a city. So we have things like, how is the land use organized? So we have a model to describe the land use. Then we have models to describe how do people potentially interact with that land use? How do they move around and what do they do? And depending on the policies you have in place, how does that influence their choices? That's a very complex kind of model to develop, as you can imagine. And then we can infer from that what sort of resources are going to be required to run a city of this nature. And then we have a, sort of another kind of model that looks at what kind of networks and technologies do you need to provide those resources? And so we sort of try to tie all of that together. And as you can imagine, that's a very complex, very difficult computational and mathematical problem. And that's really where a lot of our research challenges are. So what we've done is we've developed this thing that we call a synthetic city. It's like a city in a computer. And you can um, put together these different models, like the model that we call the, the land use model. And you can sort of design different kinds of layouts then we have the agent activities model. How do people actually behave? What will they do? Will they confound your best intentions because you know, they're used to doing things one way and you give them a different kind of city and they don't really use it properly, if you like? What does that mean in terms of resource flow and the sort of resources that people will need and where will they need them and at what time of day? And finally, what does that mean for how we sort of design the infrastructure and service networks that can, can serve that city? And what that does for us is it, it gives us lots of different views on a city, so we can see how to organize a city in space, how to design the networks. How does 
a city perform depending on how the designer wants to make money out of it. If they're trying to minimize the capital cost or the life cycle cost, you get different efficiencies. If this works, I can show you a movie, but again, Peter will uh, sort of put me to shame by having a much more sophisticated <laughs> set of movies. But you know, what our models can do is they can show at different times of day and different seasons of the year for, for a particular type of city and the way people use the city, how much heat is needed at any given place or how much electricity is given at any given part of the city or, as we'll see in a minute, how much transport fuel is, is required at different times. And so, you know, in the night and in the day and over the seasons, we can start to see if we organise the city in a particular way, what does that mean? And understanding how these demands change in time and space can help us to supply those demands as effectively as possible. So China is very excited because they have this national strategy to grow their economy without growing energy consumption in the sort of linear fashion that we've seen in those graphs. Um, and the UK is you know, is, is a place where we want to apply some of the lessons. So one of the projects we've been working on is looking at one of the 20 or so planned eco-towns with one of the developers. Unfortunately, I can't tell you which one it is. But there we've been trying to apply these concepts to see, is it in principle possible to take, a, a, say, a retrofit situation in the UK and really get it to our original target zone, which I think when we started the project, we were talking about making, you know, halving the energy intensity of cities. I think that probably isn't actually ambitious enough now that we know what we know from the latest IPCC assessments and also where we see the global resource constraints going. I think we should be looking at, at more challenging targets than that. So I hope that gives you a sort of a flavor of what we're trying to do in our project. Within that overall activity that we're working on. We have a strand which is driven by our business school here at Imperial, and that's looking at two things. One is looking at the business of designing and delivering eco-cities. So what kind of companies and what kind of competences would they need to have, firms like Arup, to do this time and again? And another challenge, which um, we won't be talking about so much today, but is even more complicated, is eventually what kind of business models will there be for companies to make more money the less resources people use? So the less electricity you use, the less gas you use, the less you drive, somebody will make more money out of it. So that needs a completely new way of thinking about how companies provide services. So that's the other strand that they're looking at. And I'm going to hand over to Lars Fredriksen, who's going to talk a bit about their research. Thank you. We heard Peter talk very interestingly about the world is changing. And we heard about Neelay's program, which is about how cities change. What we are looking at in this particular project is a very, is a taking a little bit of a different approach. From, coming from the business school, we're looking at firms, and we're looking at what firms are doing mainly. It's a research, what we call designing an eco city, the Duntang project. So it's a case study on the Duntang project. It's done with um, my colleague, Andrew Davis, and myself, and it's, we're sitting in what is called the Innovation Entrepreneurship Group here at Imperial College Business School. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor about this one research per project. It's funded by what's called the EPSRC, and it's part of that research program that Neil A. outlined, which is the Urban Energy Systems Program at Imperial College. We're trying to do this as, uh, in a collaboration with Chinese partners, because, which has been one of the challenges here, really, to work on issues of business with the Chinese in a research project. It's great, and it's, it's, it's a great experience, and it's a, also a challenge to work with Chinese academics in this field. And I think both sides are learning a lot from having just the, the, the shared idea and shared vision about what is actually we are interested in, in learning here. Um, so it's a project that's done with uh, Professor Xu Daijian from uh, Tanji University in Shanghai. 
The research is, um, as you can see, started in January 2008, and it will not finish before almost a year from now. So we're in the middle of the process, really. There's um, <clears throat> two words that kind of driven the kind of research design for this for this project. One is the the spirit, you can say, of engaged scholarship, which uh, Andrew van der Veen has uh, outlined as being a way of doing research which is not outside of the world, that or outside of the phenomenon that you're actually working with. So the idea is to be working closely with Arab and closely with Shanghai Industrial Investment Corporation, which is the client of the Dantang project. And we have been very lucky to establish good relationships. So it's giving us an opportunity to get a real deep insight in some of the topics that I'll come to in a minute. So, so far, we've done a number of interviews with key individuals. We are preparing our first survey to give us a hint about how knowledge is integrated in the project as well as how it's transferred into new projects. So that's really the approach we take. We take what is called a knowledge-based approach. Um, we've already visited the Dontang site, Arab offices in Shanghai, and we're developing this database of a number of different documents to try and find some kind of relationships between how frames, some mental frames are developed and how different people are trying to voice different attitudes for this project. So basically two key issues have come out of the, the research so far. One is what we call knowledge integration in multidisciplinary context. It's the processes within the Dontang project that we try to find out how is this taking place. Let me see my notes here. So that's basically what we can call a bottom-up approach. It's looking at how people in the Dontang project so far has been working together, cross cultures, cross disciplines, in order to integrate those knowledge bases needed to develop something like the Dontang project. Um, so one of the re one of the, some of the concepts we're looking at is this sequence in, uh, in decision making. So. Have we found, or is it so that the Dontang project has come into, the design plan at least, has come into being by se sequencing decision-making in another way that we used to? So you can say a lot of what Peter has been talking about, maybe what is determined or the needed here is that you actually have different players involved in different steps of designing these things. Right? Um, The next topic, which is also what we heard about here, is about extrapolating some of those um, new findings in processes. So our thinking about this is about how projects is delivered, where you have all kinds of projects seems to be different, so the outputs are different. A lot of pro uh, projects are different in input, but what we kind of hint to here is that there might be some generic processes in how you manage these projects. And that's what we mean by it's one of, the re one of the issues in this business model innovation part. So it's how you reuse lessons learned, which are highly contextualized. And the last bit is what we call institutional entrepreneurship, which takes the, 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 the idea that it's not enough to change the approach and put it somewhere else. You need to shape the environment wherein you are as well at the same time. And I think Arab and the Dontang project has been a good a case for this because I think we could say that Arab and the Dontang project has taken leadership in thinking about how we actually, what is the values of this, what is the norms that we apply to a good city, what is a, what is a normal city, what is a just city, and there has to be some general, what we call institutional changes in values, norms, and not least regulations. So in the Dontang case, a good example is that some of the regulation, the Chinese regulation, has actually changed as a, as, a, as a result of having trying to implement this design plan. Um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. No, we, we actually think that the three measures of emissions, greenhouse gas emissions reduction to be precise, plus lowering ecological footprint, plus human development index covers the whole thing. We, we think actually I think it's very important to have some relatively simple objectives. I'm not simple, but, but you know what I mean. To have you know a, a few, you know, a very small number, because otherwise it's impossible. Nobody can understand it. And I think that the, that has been peer-reviewed by a 
a great number of people all over the world, and everyone agrees that they're good. And if you look at the WWF State of the Planet reports, for example, they advocate exactly the same ones. So, so it's not exactly something we've invented, but it's, it's becoming a consensus view, I would say. Right, another question. <coughs> The, the question is uh, uh, whether uh, the difficulty of changing behavior to meet these uh, targets, and the question is, is how might that uh, take place? I mean, the, fir the first part of the answer is you're absolutely right, that one has to tackle it at all levels. So one has to tackle it at global policy level, at, at national, city, regional policy level. Um, and the, the, my paper does contain quite a lot of thoughts about that, that you know, like, like the examples of things on the ground, there are examples of policies that are working. You know, one I could give you is the energy feeder legislation in Germany, which has now been adopted by 50 countries around the world and is driving renewable energy massively around the world. You know, so that's one example. We, we, there are lots of these examples which can be adopted by everybody. Um, uh, there are two basic policies. One is the contract and convergence policy that, that Aubrey Mayer has proposed. The United Nations are very interested in for emissions reduction, which is this sort of convergence of, of reduction. And the other one is the shrink and share proposal, WWF have proposed for footprint reduction. So in a sense, you know, these things are sort of out there as global policies. And then we know that implementation has to happen with a combination of partnerships between governments, businesses, and communities, and NGOs. So there are now models emerging of creating community land trusts, of getting communities involved, of retrofitting on a street-by-street -street basis, with funding basically coming by, by securitizing resource efficiency, by actually capturing the money that people would be spending uh, capping that perhaps on energy, water and waste, for example, in an area, and then taking a slug of that to pay for the retrofitting, which comes from maybe a pension or sovereign wealth fund. So I could go on and on. There, there are lots of models now emerging for doing this, community uh, interest, ESCOs, and so on and so forth. You know, so quite a lot of the components of doing this are beginning to emerge. And there is a community out there actually fashioning these sorts of deals. And I've just been appointed as the innovation champion for, for Thames Gateway, and next week you'll see the launch of a, an eco-region prospectus for Thames Gateway. And our idea is to take the Thames Gateway and literally do this, what I've described to you, and to build a new economy based on bringing the world-class, um, well, we've got world-class research uh, in, in Thames Gateway, but bringing world-class companies and all the technologies that exist to remanufacturing there for Northern Europe and so on and so forth and actually you know really build the economy and uh, attract money from around the world to it and, and so hopefully we're actually going to do, do this with partnerships with universities mm. and financial sector and so on. Yeah. Is there so, anything you want to add to that I mean, on the energy I, front? I think in general um, I think one of the mistakes we're making in this area is thinking that we only can go for a softly softly approach. And, and everyone is terrified of prescription, and everyone is terrified about taking the first step. I can give you two sort of similar but less complicated examples, which are technical and one economic, which you know were you know people were terrified at the time, but they were implemented and and, and went fine. One is the Montreal Protocol on CFCs, um, which at the time people were very worried about what sort of refrigerants and other kinds of uh, fluids would we be able to use, but it was implemented and it, it's been very successful. Another one is reducing sulfur dioxide emissions in, for example, the US, particularly where they developed an emission, emissions trading scheme and a cap that came down very quickly and it uh, created a huge cleanup of, of the air. No, you know, no, nobody really talks about acid rain anymore. And yet at the time, there was a lot of debate about what should we do about it, no, we can't have a cap. And, and, and one closer to home, which is economic. So many of you probably remember the dire predictions of what would happen if we brought in a national minimum wage back in 1997, I think it was. And, and people saying, oh, we'll leave the country, and jobs will leave the country. And it was brought in, and actually, you know, from one day to the next, a lot of people's livelihoods improved, and that was about the, the, the sum of it. So I think 
the mistake that some governments make is that we can only go for a softly, softly approach, whereas in fact, I think it's, it's time to be bold and actually, on certain things, take a prescriptive approach and actually follow the lead of places like, um, is it the Emirates, where they've they, 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 they put out decrees banning um, incandescent light bulbs, for example. Lars, perhaps you might uh, enumerate how <coughs> the, the new company paradigm whereby they make more and more money for selling less and less. Uh, That's an easy question for you. It's an easy one. No, uh, let me just say that uh, being Scandinavian, I think that what uh, Britain is discovering here is that promoting progressive politics can be a way, a vehicle, to, 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 to move into new opportunities. And I think especially Sweden, but also Denmark to some extent, have had this kind of progression or progressive uh, uh, policy, which also Nile is hinting to here, and I think that is a way forward, but it has to be done with the business sense, so it's very important to have um, businesses involved in the, in, the, in the change, actually, and I think it's interesting to see that in the Don Tang project, Arab with a, a call it semi-private client, uh, SIIC, initiated this, and now there is a program across China, a national program, which also takes this um, activity of, of building eco-cities. So sometimes there might, it might be needing a business um, uh, reaction before policies actually follow. Thank you. Yeah, that's, at, at the back there, we need a mic. Thank you. The, uh, the question was, uh, uh, whether in the last video promoted the idea of self-sufficiency and whether that meant that uh, uh, humanity had to go, go back or go even, even go backwards in order to uh, uh, reduce its uh, footprint uh, and um, fulfill uh, the demands of the situation. No, I think it's, it's a very good question and actually it, it, it's an interesting concept that this might be going backwards. I mean, I see it very much as going forwards, but it's going forwards in recognizing that closing resource loops is the only way to go. And if I can just, if, if you don't mind me just telling you a quick story, because I think it's a truly inspiring story. There's a community in the Bronx who were cut off mm. from uh, shops and, and, uh, and jobs uh, who was going downhill very badly. And the only asset this community had was a basketball pitch that the kids were throwing balls into the nets at the end, but they weren't using the pitch. And so somebody in the community said, let's n put, nail a few bits of wood together and create a raised bed and go to the council and the, the city and see if they'll give us some, some uh, compost to put in here to grow some food for ourselves. <coughs> so they went along to the city and the city said, yeah, we'll give you some, but actually we'll pay you to take it. So they came back to the community in a very excited fashion saying, my God, we've got some income. We haven't even done anything yet. And, and uh, they then grow some food and uh, they took it to the local shop and of course the local people found it there. They th cooked it and said, wow, this is fantastic <coughs> food. None of us have got jobs, so why don't we all come along and actually work in this place because we haven't got jobs anyway. And by doing this, we're actually giving ourselves good food at a much lower price and we've had to buy it before. So it's creating uh, an opportunity. So the next phase was they then took it into the local restaurants and the local restaurants were cooking it and suddenly, people from around New York who are eating really awful food that's processed and comes from miles away <laughs> discovered these restaurants. So the restaurants started to attract people from New York, and then, and then economic and social development started to happen. So from absolutely nowhere, within three and a half years, this community had got itself back on its feet. They had a vibrant uh, economic situation. They had income and jobs and so on out of a basketball pitch. And if we look at, you know, look at buildings, look at the surfaces, buildings, the roofs, the, you know, if we gather and use energy efficiently, gather water in cities, think what we could do in terms of empowering human development. So uh, for me, this is absolutely blinding the obvious, and it's nothing to do with going back. It's actually to do with l learning to live on the planet sustainably. If that's going back, then fine, but it's not really. It's, it's actually a different way of thinking. It's, it's quite hard to give you those numbers. Um, there's a gentleman sitting at the back who knows something about this as well, who's, <laughs> who's ignoring me at the moment. But, but actually, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but actually uh, the problem with this is that the com you know, it's an investment proposition as a whole. It's to do with land value uplift. It's to do with mix of uses. It's a whole value proposition, which actually works in total. And then therefore doing any comparisons on one component of it is very hard. 
The fact is that there's a massive opportunity in China to, to actually take the carbon emissions reduction and put them through the CDM process and, you know, and actually turn them into money. So that's one thing that's very attractive. Uh, there are less roads in the, in the development that you would normally build, so there's a massive saving in road construction, but the renewable energy, water and waste systems are more expensive than relying on existing investments that are not properly funded and so on and so forth. I could go on and on. So there's a very complex equation that isn't easily disaggregated, but all I can tell you is that our client, who is the investor developer, thought this was a very attractive total proposition. Uh, but he was taking a long-term view, and the model really is looking at the infrastructure <coughs> investments over a long period, therefore securitizing the carbon emissions reduction from that over a long period, and then taking the investment cycle on buildings in shorter chunks, which actually embody mm -hmm. part of the infrastructure cost in the way it's worked out in China in taxes and other things. So in a sense, there are two different business models, and the investment in energy works in China because of the energy feed-in legislation that China's implemented, so you can get a deal with the mayor of Shanghai on the actual price you get for your energy. And that's why it works. It wouldn't have worked if we hadn't had that legislation in China. It's a rather long-winded uh, answer. The question for the, for, for the makers of the film was, what was the carbon cost of building Dong Tang, and what was the payback? You'll find that taken out and spliced the poor people. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I jumped it's, it's, it's a queen walking backwards or something. Isn't it? This is a question of, uh, about uh, the political systems in China as against the political systems in the West, whereby uh, the political system in, in China is, can afford to be much more long-term uh, than we can in the West. How might we change this? I actually think, in a way, it will change itself, because this prerogative is now becoming so important. You know, we are, I think by the end of next year, there won't be many people around on the planet who aren't aware of the fact that we're facing this terrible situation. The, the UN Climate Summit in Copenhagen is going to be called the last chance for the world, and that's going to be publicized very widely. And I think really people blame politicians, but, it, but in a sense it's us too. You know, we, we get the politicians we deserve, really, because we elect them. So I think uh, everywhere I go in the world, there is a growing bottom-up, top-down consensus around this subject, which is getting stronger and stronger. At the moment, in the UK, the bottom-up's very weak. I, don't, I can't explain why. HSBC did a very interesting survey of attitudes in different countries, and the bottom-up view from the community in the UK is still really not understanding this at all, which is really quite strange, whereas other countries it's very strong. So I think, in a sense, the way it will change is that by the community understanding the imperatives, and I think culture and art and many other things are important in engaging people in this subject. And I think the, the Royal Society of Arts, for example, has got a big program uh, happening in the UK. There's going to be a festival in London next summer uh, in lead up to Copenhagen. There's going to be festivals across the UK and in the core cities as well, all about climate change and getting people through art and culture and television and media to, to engage in this. So, so I think in the end it will happen simply because we've come onto a path where it will become a, you know, the obvious thing to start doing. It won't become a party polit political issue anymore, I don't think. And I suspect that will happen really quite quickly now, I would say within a couple of years. So is it possible to, uh, uh, to look at this on an individual basis? We are trying to reduce our carbon footprint, every one of us. Where can we go to find out what our carbon footprint is and how might we begin to change it as individuals? There are, there are plenty. I mean, if you want to kick off, if, if you just, you know, there are lots of levels here, but primary energy, there are plenty of websites. The, the government, the Environment Agency, have got a website where you can go and plug in your, your, your weekly, you know, plug in your electricity bills and your gas bills and things, and you can just get your footprint from there. So the Environment Agency site's quite a good one. But obviously the next level down, um, if you take primary energy, probably most of our carbon footprints, if you take products and food and everything, is about two and a half times bigger than our, our primary footprint. So, mm. so you can get quite excited about reducing your primary one, but then you've got to deal with the rest, which is much harder. It's all about selecting goods and services and food, and, and we don't really have the information to be able to do that yet. Yeah. The, uh, the question really is, uh, in the UK, um, uh, the approach is for uh, eco-towns to be funded entirely privately what is the approach in Dong Tan? 
I would say it's not entirely settled yet. Um, the tension in China is one of wanting to be innovative and using Chinese companies and Chinese investment money, but having the problem that actually their experience in investing themselves in renewable energy, but particularly water energy and waste systems in cities hasn't been very successful. You know, they, have, they don't have a very good track record of implementing things that work well. And therefore there's a tension between inter international money coming in and the worry about that and the desire to do it themselves. So there is a sort of tension going on which is not entirely resolved in terms of where the money comes from. The model is quite clear, as I tried to describe earlier, that, that the infrastructure, the water energy waste infrastructure, will be done on a, uh, on a some sort of concession type basis of long-term concession uh, for, for revenue, which will be achieved in, in certain ways for the whole place. And the big challenge there is the phasing of that in relation to the speed at which the city is built. And, and unless you have certainty on the phasing timing, it's hard to get people to sign up to concessions for infrastructure. So actually this brings me to a really fundamental point. The one thing we don't know right now is what scale of, of system we need. We don't know whether it should be a, we should have energy and water and waste systems for 80,000 people or whether it should be a single system for every home, you know, just doing that locally. And at the moment, the technologies are not mature enough to know quite what scale it should be at. So one of the things Arup's done is develop something called EcoBlock, which is actually a street scale, which is going, probably now going to be the first implementation of a number of eco-cities in China, which is being driven by the Vice Minister of Construction, who sees that as a modular approach, where you can take a street with all its water, waste and energy systems and do it street by street so you don't have to commit to a massive investment for the whole infrastructure up front. So we're learning actually all the time about those dynamics. The way that China prices um, streets and sewerage systems and canals and schools and hospitals and things is quite complex too. Some of it is done by taxation effectively that comes back through, through taxes and so on and so forth so there are complexities of that kind. So. But essentially, the, the, the energy, water, and waste infrastructure are funded in, in a different way from the rest. The uh, question was whether the panel thought GDP would remain the measure of uh, country success, perhaps, or economic success uh, as we move forward into the ecological age. Do you want me to answer? Business I studies, to perhaps? Answer. I think what's interesting about this whole issue of economic growth and economic models and uh, let's say projections in terms of things like this the question we had earlier about whether we return to what some economists call backyard capitalism <coughs> versus specialization versus return to scale is that all those models are not very good at dealing with two things one is discontinuities and the other one is resource constraints and i think the key challenges that we're dealing with today are, 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 are captured by those two concepts. So we've got resource constraints, and those resource constraints combine with very sophisticated markets, particularly futures markets rather than spot markets, to amplify small fluctuations between supply and demand to create huge price fluctuations, which is why on so many commodities and, and uh, uh, energy vectors, we see these big price fluctuations. So trying to sort of use one concept, which is for a very smooth world where things can continue on as forever, for a situation where <coughs> you've got these resource constraints, and then discontinuities will come through by either societies deciding to make changes along the, line, the, the, along the lines Peter talked about, or being forced to because either some resource runs out or it's forced to do so through climate change adaptation will mean that I think we'll start to use some other measures of societal development which may not be narrow economic development and in fact there are many indices that people are coming up with now and of course the UN has the HDI and for some part of the world it looks at progress towards MDGs but there mm -hmm. are things like uh, the Happy Planet Index, for example, that some people might be familiar with. There's the New Economic Foundation, which has its own indices of, of development. So I think 
you're right. I think people will start to become a bit more sophisticated about indices that they use to measure societal progress. But the key thing is those can't be couched in narrow economic terms because then they don't recognise the need to deal with discontinuities and resource constraints. I, I, I think, but basically, I think the first step is going to be valuing ecosystem services because obviously if you're driving policy around GDP, you're, you're ignoring the fact you're destroying the thing that supports us. So the first step is to value ecosystem <coughs> services to actually see what damage is causing or what the impact is. As soon as you start to do that, then people will, will invent a new policy <coughs> model for, for driving economics because clearly the current one isn't taking account of that. So I think that's the first step. But I think very quickly, and I suspect that probably people are thinking about it doing right now, is actually measuring the efficiency of renewable resource consumption in every country in the world. And very quickly, people will see that the classic economics of countries that have the highest factors of those will start to stand out above others. And I suspect Scandinavian countries will fairly quickly begin to stand out uh, because they, they're actually in much better shape than we are. And I, I think that will happen within five years. So I, th I think this is such a huge um, falling over of the old model that I, I think ec economists will begin to get their heads around this. And if, if you want to read a good textbook uh, on, on this, it's Ecological Economics. I, I think, personally, it's Herman Daly's textbook is the best textbook that describes the new model and how it will be measured and what policies are required to drive it. And, and there are three different types of policies which are in there. Which uh, And actually, there's another metric in there for measuring resource efficiency, too which is actually a very clever one, which I think will also be used. So I personally think that Herman Daly's textbook is the textbook for the new, the new model. Thank you. Lars? Uh, just, just a few comments. In, in the business schools, what, what is going on there on this issue is actually that there are people working on this um, happiness index, which in economics now are being slowly accepted as a new way of measuring um, some kind of activities, you can say. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, I just want to say that I think there's a lot of things that we don't know about here. There's a lot of questions that we really, I know it's a, it's a cliche, but we do need more research here. <laughs> um, and I can just flag up a little bit that this event is, is done by this network, which I'm part of, it's called Ecosit. And some of the things we're looking at is, for example, like rather mundane but quite tricky questions. So in Dontang, how would you support entrepreneurship? China is the most entrepreneurial uh, economy in the world. Can that be transformed into some kind of sustainable entrepreneurship? Are there downsides of having a lot of entrepreneurs? Right now the mantra is we need more entrepreneurs, but maybe there's no need for a lot of entrepreneurs, but for the right kind of entrepreneurs. There's uh, other projects which looks at, for example, are the technology providers in China actually ready to supply um, some of the, the technologies that Peter was talking about? So um, I think there are research going in this direction, but we actually need more knowledge about it before we can actually Say, and that's, that's also the kind of social sciences. I mean, we are, in a sense, different from the engineering um, research in the sense that we're looking backwards is what ha happened and try to deduce some uh, insights from that rather than go out and do, just do the changes. I, I was wondering uh, whether, in fact, the uh, models that were being developed by Neele would be uh, um, turned into a computer game like SimCity and we'd have an Echo Sit City. <laughs> Uh, and, and which, which would help to get a lot of people, SimCity, for a num number of you will be familiar with it, it was uh, developed about 20 years ago, in which uh, you could play with uh, deciding to build a power station and that, but then you found you didn't have enough money to uh, collect the rubbish off the streets, and so there was a real economic game. And it seems to me that the development of this kind of game, perhaps it's going on, would be very, very <coughs> valuable. Mm, yeah, no, that's one of the things we've been debating all right. As we <laughs> sort of develop our models, how to create a sort of a public engagement version of them? Because there's a there's a there's a good paradigm of some research that was done in Princeton called stabilization wedges, which sort of put across to people the the need for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and allowed people to develop their own strategies and to see how well they could do. And and we definitely want to take advantage of that. In fact. Chevron Texaco now have something on their website that they call right. Energy Bill, right. which is for people to try to, to drive us. But it's, it's still sort of, I would say, 
not as forward looking as it could be. It's not at the sort of level that the level that we need. That Peter's, yeah. Peter's spoken about today. The, the question was what uh, um, what opportunities might arise from the retrofit of cities um, in the UK. Uh, what kind of firms would be involved? What kind of technologies? Well, I think I described the technologies. Um, uh, I think fairly comprehensively. Um, there are quite a lot of new ones in there, you know, like food production, for example. You know, that's a completely new one. But there are some very traditional ones, like insulating buildings, you know, which is a fairly <coughs> traditional one. But I think what they all will have is a completely high-tech approach. So, for example, putting insulation in a building, one will be surveying it using radar systems, you know, where you walk around and do a quick survey of a room and another room. And then you come with pre-cut panels already cut just to fit, you know, in a very quick and rapid operation. So I think all of this is quite <coughs> high tech. So I think one of the big opportunities there is, is training and retraining and development of skills around these requirements so the community benefit from, from the skills. So I think quite a lot of it is actually quite suitable to upskill <coughs> population, particularly people who are out of jobs and things, could be, I think, could be retrained and skilled up to, to, to really contribute. And I, I think quite a lot of the work will be done by quite small companies rather than major ones working in partnerships. Uh, so, you know, you develop the local. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't see this as big corporations sort of coming and doing it, you know, you know Siemens or Honeywell, which is what's happening in America. They're, they're doing a lot of the retrofits in San Francisco, for example. I, I think in the UK it's much more local and so on. And I think the work is more fi fine-tuned work in communities, not massive infrastructure interventions, is, is my sort of general view of it. Our, our models more or less confirm exactly that, that it, it's interventions in the existing housing stock of, <coughs> I would say, the actual technology that you're fitting in isn't very complicated, but methods to get that employed at huge scales. So that it's the innovation in the service delivery that, that would be the number one thing. And, and time and again, the kinds of cost-benefit analysis and economic analysis and the cost of carbon savings on with, for, at least for the UK, come up with, with that same answer. And actually, I think the government's taken that on board and be interested to see how that actually pans out in practice. Mm. Do you want to say um, just want to say that uh, Joseph Schumpeter said in um, 1932, or I think, something about that innovation is actually recombination. I think that applies to this, this thing, that it may be not be new technologies, as Peter says, but it's a recombination. And actually, Duntang is a fantastic project in that sense, that it's true recombination of existing things mostly. Um, so what we in, in, in the business school call the value proposition could be something along the lines as integrated systems solutions. So thinking along the lines that you're offering not only one service, for example, so this idea of Moscow's multi-utility service companies, for example, is that a, 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 a vehicle forward, for example, or could it be um, what, what, what we call, um, uh, where you have these community ESCOs. Again, we don't know if they're, if they're profitable for, for, for different stakeholders in this, so we need to, to find out about these things. One, one, one thing we haven't mentioned, which is green leases. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the really attractive models for this is people signing up long-term deals, whether it's a tenant in a building or a, or a house owner, and, the, and that utility deal gets passed on with the house, so it becomes an asset for someone moving in because they've got a special deal on utilities compared with moving somewhere else. And that sort of thing secures the, the long-term revenue and it's quite easy to do. So, so there, you know, there are new ideas here which can be implemented quite readily to secure the long-term future of this. That was a long question to uh, put down into a few words. Um, but it really surrounded the the uh, the, the statement that as long as we were talking about technology, then we were on a firmer footing than we would be if we were talking about politics and, and society. And uh, the difficulties of the constraints and discontinuities <coughs> and the political views uh, made the whole thing very, very much more di difficult to implement. I think that's the uh, yeah, I, I, synopsis. I, I totally agree with you. And actually, we deliberately set out to actually say with the current trajectory of world population, is it possible to live sustainably on the planet? 
uh, and done that deliberately. And very often at these events, I get people say to me, well, what about controlling the population? You know, and I say, well, that's actually not what this is about. This is about actually learning to live sustainably on the planet, on the trajectory we're on. But I think, I think another part of your question is, is the cultural dimension we haven't really talked about. But we, we are sure, the United Nations are sure, that we have to dig and reach back into the cultural history of communities and actually pull, pull out of that the, the understanding of, of cultural change. And there is no doubt, as was said earlier, that teaching young children is dead easy because young children get this really easily because they don't have anything else and they just think it's sensible, really. Uh, they connect with their grandparents who are still just about connected to the cultural history and they then put a squeeze on the, on the parents and that is a model that's happening all over the world, actually. And, and so it is, a, it is a way that teaching very young children and engaging grandparents in the connection back into cultural history and the understanding of the sort of echoes that you've hinted at of the past, you know, and the some of the terrible things that have happened, you know, is something that's, that's very fresh and therefore needs to be brought through into, into an optimistic, not exactly technical, but a, an optimistic view that this is possible. You know, this isn't, doesn't require anything else. It just needs us to get on with the stuff I've talked about. Mm. Well, thank can, you. Thank can you I, can I just say, for that. Okay, can Let's I just say, on. I think it's very dangerous to dig that trench between technical issues and political issues. I think the solution is actually is to engage with that what we can call tech, social technical change. So I think making that thing about staying where we think we are safe in technology is, is the big mistake actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Forty years ago, Peter Head sat in those seats and received what it was I suspect a rather conventional civil engineering education here at Imperial College. And clearly it stood him in very good stead. <laughs> <laughs> because not only did he have an extremely successful early career in, in what might be called conventional structural engineering, delivering large scale bridge projects, but I suspect as a result of his experience on one of those, the second seven crossing, he came to realize that there was much more to it than just delivering the technical solutions. It was all about looking at the totality of things, taking the holistic view, considering the full set of issues, and actually realizing that there was a vehicle there for delivering something much more than just the obvious solution to the obvious problem. I think tonight we've heard how it's possible to bring in questions of economic, social, and ecological viewpoints, and by including the views from Lars and the business school, and Neele on the technical and, and modeling aspects, we've seen how all of these can gel together to actually propose a, a vision of the future that's clearly something much better than simply looking back into the past. Picking out three or four key phrases, I think, from this evening's presentations, I heard the phrase, setting new standards. And isn't the Dong Tang project and all that flows therefrom about setting new standards, not just for the way in which people live and run their lives, but for the way in which we actually enable them to live and run their lives. <coughs> Making use of existing technology. Time and time again this evening, we heard much of what we want is already available. It's about organizing it, having the will, and deciding that that's what we're going to do. And we also heard about learning from projects, about not regarding the completion of a project as being the end of the story, but just the opportunity to roll forward some of those lessons to make further improvements going into the future. I think what we've heard from this evening's speakers and, and uh, enhanced by the, the discussion that followed is really something about a vision for the future, something that promises a much better tomorrow and that provides those of us that tune into this sort of um, presentation hope that some of the rather darker um, 
prognoses that, that we hear about uh, what's inevitable and what's going to happen to the world and its effect on civilization can indeed be arrested. And just finally, I caught in the answer really to that last question, a personal message from me, which is that I must go home and I must engage with my grandson <laughs> and I must ensure that between us we wean our daughters off their rather consumerist style of life <laughs> <laughs> that they, they like to enjoy now and get back to something that actually um, is, is more sustainable and more forward-looking. I think we've had a wonderful evening. I think we're extremely grateful to, to Rod and the, the uh, organisers from the Friends of Imperial College for actually having the, the, the vision uh, and the imagination to, uh, to set up an evening of this sort for inviting absolutely the right set of people to sit here on the platform and to engage with us in all sorts of ways and I'd like you the audience now to show your appreciation for their contribution this evening.